It's Torah Talk. It's Torah Talk. It's Torah Talk. It's Torah Talk. What is my name? What is my son's name? It's Torah Talk. We are witnesses and watchmen of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. <coughs> it's the Torah Zone! How's it going today? <laughs> Good, yeah. Mike. Oh, hey, sister. Hey, hello. Your your voice is uh, coming and going. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I think so. How you doing? Yeah, good. Very good. You guys look well. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, we rested all day. Wonderful. Isn't it good? Did you have a, you have a good rest? Yeah, I only got up to 15 minutes ago, so <laughs> oh. we're ready to roll. Yes, indeed. <laughs> wonderful. Well, I, I love you and Amy. It's wonderful hearing from you, email, and seeing you. Yeah, you too, sister. Yeah. Y'all have a good talk. Thank you. If we need her, if we need her for anything, we'll call her back. Yeah, okay. for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Wonderful. Feels like ages, brother. Oh, it does. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah. Well, I've been working harder and harder at that secular job, it seems like. But uh, yeah. We had a very successful seminar last weekend, and uh, it yeah. went off well. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah, I haven't heard much about it because we haven't seen each other for ages. Yeah, I didn't have much time to prepare. I only had a week. Uh, it seems like a lot, but I mean, a week to me is packed with all kinds of other things. And I uh, mm. Oh, today mm. I've been just studying uh, off this topic of the bride, but, you know, trying to help people with this uh, new new heresy that's been growing it's been around for you know close to 20 years 18 to 19 years it's been hiding in the in the, in the shadows and it's called the day spring doctrine we'll we'll probably be hearing it about it but uh, yeah. it's the next thing yeah you've been working hard on that haven't you there's been a lot of um a lot of study going into that yeah yeah well the um the definition of words can be very, you know, troubling to people. Hmm. We uh, we try to, you know, help them with it, and uh, we're not stretching things out of uh, out of, uh, you know, out of bounds. Hmm. We try to not do that, but we look at the guidance that we see in Scripture and the way others walked, and of course they do the same. They see different things, though, you know. Hmm. So uh, you know, but we all have to overcome the. Uh, problems by loving one another principally and having the fruit of the spirit it's not the fruit of the spirit for us to get up in one another's face and speak loudly and accusatory and you know judgmentally it's uh, that's not the fruit you know the hmm. the best way to help someone overcome a stronghold of thought or reasoning is to be kind and gentle and patient and loving and, and not hmm. Not threatened. I mean, you know, anger is usually the result of someone who is threatened themselves and they feel unsure, so they have to stress it. And of course, if one topic defines you, then you know if you're always having to explain what it is that makes you different and everybody else wrong. If that one topic is a problem area, some people just don't go there at all. Some people, it defines them, you know. Mm. And we see that, you know. Mm -hmm. But today's topic on the bride is very interesting because it's going to bring out the, uh, the, the idea that we're able to identify the bride by her, her behavior, you know, the way that the bride actually behaves and acts in the world, especially to the other members that are the bride. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be hateful to one another, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had uh, no idea until this week that um, you're getting roasted just for having seminars on a Sunday. <laughs> oh, is that another problem? Yeah, I didn't know that. It's the first day of the week, and that's yeah. when Yahushua went back to work himself when he resurrected. It was the first yeah. day of the week, as we understand it, at evening, after the Sabbath. And so he was in the tomb for the, for the real Sabbath. And then he just came up as the Sabbath ended and went back to work. Yeah. So the first day of the week is when I go back to work, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. It's just like that low, he doesn't, doesn't have his seminars on the Sabbath like you should. I'm thinking, what, when you're, what? Supposed, you're supposed to be at home resting, aren't you? <laughs> is that what they did in the camp of Israel when they were in the wilderness? And, oh, everybody get up. Come on, hurry up. Get over here. The Levites are all waiting on you. They're over there roasting things, and you need to be there to listen. <laughs> Get roasted. He said, <laughs> he said, let no man go out of this place on the Sabbath. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, what is that? Uh, Exodus, Shema, cha chapter 16. Mm. I think verse 19, but I'm probably going to be wrong about that. Um, but anyway, it's, it's chapter 16. But anyway, you're supposed to be in your tent, 
or your dwelling. It's in all your dwellings. That's where your Sabbath happens. And you're supposed to be teaching your children these commandments. You know, yeah. it doesn't mm -hmm. say go to the priest or anything because we're all priests. Yeah, you know, we're the we're the nation of Israel, and we're supposed to be teaching the nations, mm -hmm. not arguing with each other, going, "No, you've got it wrong." <laughs> This day doesn't start until sunrise. What are you doing resting? Or whatever it is. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's crazy. It, it's, it's amazing, really. Sunday just happens to be the most convenient day if you happen to do Sabbath and you have a weekend. So, <laughs> to yeah. Get it, to get everyone together. Nothing to do with the sun. No. And I'm a defiant Constantine. Uh, in 321, he forbade the. Uh, you know the operation of shops and and other manufacturing and anything like that, except for farms, they were exempt. But under penalty of death, they had to have the shops closed in honor of the day of the sun. And I uh, have to work on that day at my secular job. Hmm. You know, I praise you who I have a job. You know, it's a struggle. You know, in this world, in this at this time to to just keep the bills paid. Mm -hmm. But uh, we all work as, as hard as we can. Mm -hmm. But uh, the first day of the week is certainly a day to work. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, he didn't, you know, want us to do anything but the commandment to rest on the Sabbath. So I, I, I'm sorry that those that are watching this might have a different idea about what I'm doing, about, you know, that he didn't command anybody to have a seminar on the Sabbath. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm in violation, then it must be a man's law, you know, that I'm, I'm violating. It might be a custom of men, but, you know, our fathers have inherited nothing but falsehood mm. and things of no profit, you know. Mm. What is that? You, Jeremiah, you're my Yahoo 16. If you verse say 19. so. <laughs> oh, but verse 19, I think. Yeah. I might be wrong about the other one. I think it's Shemoth 16. Mm. For instance. But uh, yeah. anyway. Uh, yeah, the bride. Big the bride. Day. Amazing. It's a big topic, but at the same time, you know, it's sort of very simple, but straightforward, because there's a, a wedding supper, and of course the bride needs to be present at the wedding supper, and <laughs> yeah. we've talked about this in the two resurrections a little, mm. you know, about the, uh, the first resurrection, of course Yahushua's resurrection was the first one, but he's first fruits, but we're... The bride is the first fruits. 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 That's another code word for the bride. The first fruits. Hmm. And the first fruits from many. I mean, the, the harvest is going to be great. A lot of people are going to be rescued. But the bride is apparently the only one that is resurrected at the first resurrection. You know, um, so we have that to, 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 I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not in charge. So, you know, it could be different if the boss wants to do that. But, you know, the, the, the head. But it, as we understand it, the bride is not just a, a close locked. It doesn't lock out everyone else. The bride is a special group. Malachi 3 talks about the bride a little bit, about a treasured possession. And we're his inheritance, you know. Mm. So his inheritance, and, we, and he's our inheritance. So that's a very uh, interesting thing. So oh, where do you want to start on this? Uh, oh, wherever you'd like, brother. I mean, I sent you that thing yesterday just because. Did you get that? Yes, I did. And uh, I was just thinking, uh, I was looking at the slides on the study. And half of them don't have any words on them? <laughs> Well, it looks a little different. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it's designed a bit strangely, that one. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. it, it, it really would be probably best to start out with the questions of who is the bride. Mm. You know, and of course, the, the, the general picture of the bride uh, is Israel. You know, he talks about Israel corporately as being his wife so a bride and a wife are the same thing and the false bride 
would be the ones who think they're the bride, but they're not. So I, I see the ten virgins as being the bride, but they're going to be treated somewhat differentially because of the fact that some are wise and they're ready for his coming. And then the ones that don't get in are still his bride. They were waiting for him, but they are delayed in entering the wedding feast because the door is shut. Hmm. In other words, there's a, there's a little bit of a close group, and then there's a, a bigger, larger group that I think pertains to the five unwise virgins. So, you know, there, that's a, a point that we could all argue about or, or agree on, but I think that what we're looking at there is a differentiation or a distinction. Um, mm -hmm. The bride is going to appear at his coming because, you know, he says, I will not drink of the cup, the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom. And the kingdom is coming to earth when he's here with us. And the first thousand years, or I should say the last thousand years of the millennium, we will be reigning with him, the bride, and we will be actually... A, a, a fortress, you know, coming down from the skies with him, mm. you know, and that at the first resurrection. Mm. For anybody who's really nervous or a bit freaked out hearing this about the bride and the ten virgins, and what is it? What are the overall defining characteristics of the wise virgins? Just simply that you would say, these are the main things that you should be going for. Uh, because, I mean, we all love Yahushua, but you know, a lot of us just get carried away in other things. So, to be a wise virgin and to be ready, what, what are the most important things to be putting your eyes on? Well, the scripture at Malachi 3 that describes the treasure of possession, there's something they're doing. They're, um, they're meditating upon the name of Yahuwah, and they're very much notice because he actually writes a special scroll you know and he says these will be mine when i spare them because he's he's talking about something that's happening before his coming and then he's preparing his bride and watching for this distinction and uh, they're actually meditating on his word and his name and the nazarene were prophetically those people who would do that because we see that that's what we're, we are doing. But <clears throat> then again, we've got Revelation, which discusses the first fruits. And it mentions the sealing. And the sealing of those who are sealed for protection from harm from him during the Great Tribulation, just prior to his coming, you know, before the seven last bowls are poured out on the earth. The, the 144,000, as they're described, 12,000 from each of the individual tribes of Israel are sealed with the Father's name in their foreheads. Now, where is your forehead? Well, it's, uh, it is, um, it's another code word for your mind. You know, it's not uh, written up here on, your, on the outside. It's in your forehead, you know, where, you, where your thoughts are contained and where you make your decisions and choices. So we meditate upon his name and uh, we speak to one another and that's what we're doing here too and listen and he says there they are and what he's doing is he's writing a special scroll with their names in it to be kept from harm during the, the great tribulation and then Revelation 12 and it's repeated in Revelation 14 that they're doing two things. They're holding to the, they're, they're, they're obeying or guarding the commandments of Elohim, which would be the Ten Commandments. And they're also holding to the testimony of Yahushua. So those two distinction, distinctions. Now, let's look at the uh, Christianity, for example. Now, are, which, are they the bride? They certainly claim to be. And all the daughters of the Roman Christian uh, circus are thinking that they are the bride. And uh, it would be very strange for them to hear that, well, look at, the, look at the first fruits. The first fruits are the bride. And what are you doing? 
are you keeping the commandments of Elohim? And they'll say, well, certainly, we're a full gospel circus. Well, are you really? Because you see, the, the full gospel, it, it includes the message of the kingdom, which is, you know, to go and teach all the nations everything I commanded you to obey, which is, as priests, we go to the nations, the ones that don't know. And we teach them. We teach them his name, which is the first thing he brings up, and then teach them to obey everything. And they shorten that. You know, they, they leave out the word obey when they're in the pulpit. I was listening to a preacher on the radio that left that out. And I, I thought that was interesting. And then this same preacher, um, may Yahuwah bless him, uh, was saying that uh, Hebrews 4, he read it. He read it verbatim. You know, and, and then, well, let me see if I can find it here. I had it. Uh, Hebrews 4, it says, for, some, for somewhere, he has said this about the seventh day. And Elohim rested on the seventh day from all his works. And in this again, if they shall enter into my rest, since that it remains for some to enter into it, and those who formerly received the gospel did not enter in because of disobedience, he again defines a certain day, today, saying through Daoud, so much later, as it has been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Yahusha, that's uh, the one that succeeded Moshe, had given them rest, he would have not spoken of another day after that. So there remains, there remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of Elohim. For the one having entered into his rest has himself also rested from his own works as Elohim rested from his own. Let us therefore do our utmost to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. And then it goes into, for the word, now that's the, the commandments, is living and, 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 and working and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through even to the dividing of spirit, of being and spirit, and of joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So there it is. Uh, and then this preacher, after having read that, said, now we don't want to be legalistic about anything, but I have my own Sabbath. I keep it on, and he used the word F-R-I day. He says, that's the day I take off, and I spend it with my wife. Well, what about Yahuwah? You know. Well, anyway, anyway, who is the false bride? The one who thinks that they're the bride by dis being deceived. Now, who's deceiving the world? So, that would be the dragon. So, who's following who? We're the servants of the one whom we obey. Now, if we're obeying the dragon, and we are taught that we're the bride, and we don't keep the commandments, then, but we do hold to the testimony of Yahushua. We believe in Yahushua. We don't use that name, though. We use a Greek name that was given to us by the dragon. So we have all these little changes that have been made, like what days of the week we rest and what days we um, come together. There's only three times in a year that we're required to come together, all males over 20. And that's, uh, you know, the festival times that uh, Christians don't even, even know anything about. Their, their teachers do, but they don't teach the the people those things. Because, see, those are the commandments of Yahuwah. And the dragon does not want those things taught. So, you know, the redemption plan, you know, the festivals of Israel. You know. Actually, they're Yahuwah's festivals, but, you know, his uh, Moedim, as, as they're called. So, anyway, there it is. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm off on a side point there. No, it's beautiful. Yeah. Wonderful. I, uh, sorry to go off on another one, but I couldn't believe how many um, people, uh, like, uh, it reminded me because you're reading from Galatians, it's written by our brother Paul, I just can't believe that so many people have sort of wiped out his teaching, like you did that seminar ages ago and I just sort of nodded along and went, yeah, great, never had any experience with, I even wondered why you were doing it, because I thought, why, why is this even relevant, but now I've sort of, Going out into the field a little bit. 
you uh, you realise just how many people have sort of cut more than half of the New Testament out of their belief system, out of their like reference. You think so? You think Paul was part of the bride? No, oh, I'm I'm sure of it. Yeah, he uh, he said that he wasn't sure that he was of the higher calling, which is the bride. The higher calling is the first resurrection. Mm. People need to go back and look at that seminar and the scriptures. That are, yeah, for sure. But if you don't, if you don't have Paul to, to study his inspired writings, then you don't have all those things to know about. You wouldn't even know the word, the phrase "higher calling." You would have to throw out Kepha or Peter, Luke, who hung out with him. The writer of Acts was Luke. Uh, you have to throw out uh, Yaakov, Yahushua's brother or James, because all, all those guys gave him the right hand of fellowship, according to the book of Acts. So, uh, and then you've got to throw out Barnaba, Timothy, uh, you know, the, well, you know, there's a whole bunch of people you have to just throw away. You know, the, all you really wind up with, a lot of them is uh, the book of Matthew, or Matthew, and then, well, you know, you don't have, you can't have Mark either, because Mark was involved with Paul. Yeah, and then we've got, uh, well, just a whole bunch of people that you just don't have. Yeah. You know, and you, what do you, what do you, what, what do you left with? Mm. But yeah. Paul has an, an, an immense amount of, uh, you know, he has a mighty, a mighty brain. I mean, I, I have to admit that I could, he doesn't follow a lot of good writing techniques, but he has a lot of information, a lot of spiritual information, but, um, uh, even Kepha or Peter warned us that those people who are misinterpreting or misunderstanding Paul are doing so uh, because of lawlessness. But in, in our case, we have not serene who are Torah loving, and they reject Paul because they're misinterpreting that he, what he's saying because he sounds lawless, and he's not. He's mm -hmm. talking about something like the circumcision or something, like in Galatians. Galatians, the topic is circumcision. That's the law that he's talking about. And that circumcision is now of the heart. It's a higher circumcision done by Messiah. And if any man were to go and do a physical circumcision after, as an adult, I'm not talking about we're not, we are to circumcise our male children, but, you know, at, at, at the eighth day. But now beyond that, after that, it's, you know, as we enter into adolescence and adulthood, it's, it's uh, something that happens to the heart, you know, because it's by hearing, you know, that we are hearing the truth mm -hmm. and, and rescued and delivered. Um, anyway, the land covenant was tied to circumcision. Mm -hmm. And in order to partake of Pesach and Passover, you'd have to have been circumcised. Mm. Well, it's all relevant because uh, this is we're talking about the bride, and this is all bride issues. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of bride issues. <laughs> there's a lot of bride issues. Yeah, wonderful. And the, the bride is uh, needing to be kind and loving, gentle and patient. But uh, the war in heaven that's being waged is over the bride mostly. Mm. You know that's what we're sensing, the pressure. Mm. But uh, on the day of redemption, the day where our, our bodies, if we're yet alive, will be transformed in a moment, in a moment, and we will not see the first death, even though there, it's written that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. But um, at those people are going to be a special treasure possession, as will those that precede them that are resurrected on the young, on day of the day of the shout, uh, the first day of the seventh month, one of these years. The dead will be raised; they will be the bride, the bride too. But all of the dead are not raised until a thousand years later, at the great white throne judgment. And some of those will be found in the book of life or the scroll of life. The ones whose names are not found, they're thrown into the lake of fire. Mm. Well, but anyway, um, you make it sound so clear. This is not not complicated, is it? Well, yeah. There's a lot 
people that have made it complicated. I'm trying yeah. to make it simple, but yeah. it is not that hard. But um, it's interesting, though, know, if you want to know who the bride is, if you look to Revelation 21, I think it's around verse 9, it says, And one of the seven messengers, now the, we talked about them a few minutes ago, the seven messengers who hold the seven bowls filled with the last plagues, okay, this is one of those messengers, came to Yahukana and said to him, Come, I shall show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Wow. Anyway, uh, so the, and then he describes the bride as a great city coming from the skies, and her light was like a most precious stone, clear as crystal, and named the new Jerusalem. And the twelve gates each bear a name for a tribe of, of Israel. It doesn't mention anything about a circus or a pope or any of those uh, bishops and cardinals. It's a matter of, uh, you know, Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not a different Israel. It's the same Israel. The descendants and, uh, and, and also those that engraft. So people that are practicing error will be blocked from entering. Mm -hmm. The um, how there's a gate for each tribe. Do you consider the twelve tribes the one hundred forty-four thousand like a figurative number? Or do you think he's waiting for the one hundred forty-fourth person to come in and then he's going to shut the door? You know, if we were in charge, we could answer that. Okay, uh, <laughs> but as I as I feel about it, though. I leave that up to him, and if he wants it to be figurative, then he can make it that way. But I think it's uh, saying what it what he means. Hmm. And I guess uh, there's going to be a point when the last person, that after we've gone out into the alleys and the highways, seeking those people who never heard, and, and waking them up from their dream and going, come here, we need to fill this house. Will you listen to this? And they might go, yeah, what is it? And then we'll explain it to them. And then the last person that we have to go hunt down, we don't know who's going to find them, but it, it's probably going to be something like that. Mm -hmm. And when this house has got enough people, then there's going to be a, a, a the door will be shut, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the door is a pro, a probably figure to, you yeah. know, <laughs> he closes the door. I think that's a figure of speech, a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Well, it would just encourage people all the more to um, overcome and be full of love if, if, if it was a, a real number, because that's not many, is it? Not really. But the bride is a limited number. Mm. And there are billions of people that have lived on this planet uh, and are alive now that are not real interested. I mean, I've talked to them. I see them. It's dead. They're dead. They're living dead. They're literally zombies. Hmm. And they don't care. You tell them, uh, well, you know, you're not supposed to eat that. That's a ham sandwich, or that's a some kind of crawfish, or a lobster, or uh, what do they call that? A shrimp. You know, that's not allowed. That's not hmm. food. And yet they'll they'll look at you and go, oh well, who cares? And I'm going to go get a tattoo later on, and uh, you know, I don't really want to talk about that anymore. And I'm going, wait a minute, uh, tattoo? Uh, you know, that's also prohibited. Leviticus <laughs> yeah. 19, or, you know. And so, yeah. what, are you, what are you doing? See, we, uh, they don't care. They don't care. And uh, <laughs> mm. what can you do? Yeah. It's, it's not that we're judging. I mean, I yeah. don't. If you, you know, Yahushua hung around with the very people that we do in the world. They were in the world. I mean, totally. Uh, they were prostitutes, uh, murderers, drug thieves, uh, gamblers, people that were, uh, you know, I don't mean gamblers. Uh, I mean, like, people that were, uh, oh, drug users, and, you know, liars. You know, they just didn't care. But, you know, hopefully, when he was in their midst, though, he wasn't, like, saying, away with you, you know. He was actually appealing to them and being with them, and so that he could be a help, a doctor, a physician. You know, he was working among what we would call lepers, literally 
lepers. <laughs> Some of them were literally lepers. But everyone has this, the leprosy of sin. And so that's where we have our, our work. But mm. well. so we have to gather as many as we can to the tree of life so that they can be counted worthy. It says, Blessed are those doing his commands, so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life, and to enter in through the gate, in to the through the gates to the city. So we're looking at uh, people that are that are willing to listen once in a while, that have had some of the watering and planting done before, and then we come along and water it some more, and we see a spark of life start to, to rise up. I see it often, several times a day sometimes. Sometimes a, a day will go by and I don't see anyone. And then another day I'll see one or two or three. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. And you can give them something to take home and study and, you know, or think about. That's amazing, bringing people to the tree of life. It's a good thing yeah. to think about. That's your issue, isn't it, the tree of life? Yeah, yeah it, it's him. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Anyway, they were, uh, you know, in the sermons and all the radio and TV shows, you see, the false bride and the false teachers, the masquerading people, are guiding people away from obeying the commandments. They actually are. They use little uh, code words and maxims like legalism. That's a one word maxim. You know, and that guides people away from obeying. And now, um, obedience is is the fruit of righteousness. The bride obeys Yahuwah's commandments. That's what, that's what we're doing. And we identify the tree by the fruit that we see on the tree. And by the fruit that we see in the bride, we can identify her. Now, if we see what we think is the bride observing Christmas or the Bunny Rabbit Festival or Sunday or Lent or Ash W Day or Halloween, which all stem directly from pagan practices and times, it might be that we're looking at people that are deceived. So, you know, you have to ask yourself where in Scripture was the bride instructed to practice any of these things? And the houses of worship that have steeples on them. I mean, basically, that's a, a phallus. That's a witch hat. You're looking at a building with a witch hat on it. You know, and practiced inside is witchcraft. Because witchcraft is anything that's in rebellion. And if, if, it's, if they're rebelling against the commandments. Now, it is true that they're very righteous acting and talking. They talk righteousness. But that's all part of the deception, too, because you see... The one that you obey is the one that, whose servant you are. And if you're obeying the wrong one, and, and you know, and the dragon seeks to be like the Most High. If you read Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 14, he says that he wants to be like the Most High. So he imitates to a large extent even the covenant, except for where it's changed, you know where he's divided and diverted the day. Like he used Constantine to move the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. And everybody thought that was great. And he just gave them a reason. And the sheep all went, that sounds great to me. Who should resurrect on the first day of the week? <laughs> and then they have these sunrise services, just like Ezekiel chapter 8, I think it is, where the people were the priests, the 25 men went out to face the sun, you know, and uh, it was a sunrise service as it dawned. And we have all these symbols, obelisks, you know, and steeples. The same, they're the same thing. Well, let's see, what else do we have? We've got a, a list of things that the false bride does, like false worship. Uh, they have these things called masses. They have strange festivals that are not mentioned in Scripture. They have Sunday, the day of the sun. They've got Christmas. They've got the Bunny Rabbit Festival, which actually bears the name of the Earth Mother, E-A-S-T-E-R, if you look it up on the Internet. 
in a dictionary. Halloween, they have pillars of jealousy, which is mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 8. You know, and the, they've got one right down there in the middle of a big wheel uh, in front of the, the Vatican. Hmm. They use bells. What? Where's bells? Well, bells are, were, were used, but only by the high priest when they were small. They went around the garment that he was wearing to make sure that they could hear him moving around. But there wasn't any bells being rung from steeples. That was done in ancient Rome when they worshipped A-P-O-L-L-O. They used this thing called holy water. Holy water. What? Okay, then. Images. Images. They put them up. Now, the ones that don't put up images, um, they're okay uh, in that regard, but and they may not use holy water either. But uh, Anyway, they have this thing also called rosaries, or chaplet, a chaplet of beads, which was inherited from the Hindus. And the Islamic people also inherited it from the Catholics. They don't know that, maybe, but the Hindus gave it to the Catholics, the Catholics gave it to the Islamic people. They have um, priests and laity. In other words, the people and the priests. And there's this dichotomy, the divisions. They have uh, human ordinations, you know, where Yahuwah didn't ordain them, but other men did. And they teach them that if you keep these rules, then you're of our sect. You know, like your denominational sectarianism, which is prohibited. There cannot be divisions in the body. That's not allowed. So when people say, well, uh, are, if the Baptists are right, does that mean all the rest of them are wrong? Well, it actually means that they're all wrong because they're divisions. They're factions. Mm. So we can't have factions. Yeah. So what we do is the evidence of our belief. And, you know, James, or Yaakov, Yahushua's own half-brother had the same mother but different fathers. He said, you see then that a man is declared right by works and not by belief alone. So our, the evidence of our belief is actually in what we do. If you keep the commandments, now, you know, let's look at the first commandment. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Mm -hmm. Have no other before my face. Statue of uh, whoever, Saint Elmo, <laughs> and there probably is a Saint Elmo. And you're looking at him, and you're lighting a candle in front of him. You know, you didn't notice the first commandment. You know, how'd you overlook that? <laughs> not, not bowing to idols, the second commandment, and then not uh, destroying his name, the third commandment. Okay. Well, if you don't use it at all, or if you've never heard it then you're not really that guilty. But if you have heard the commandment and you understand it, then you are not keeping the commandment if you don't say his name. If you don't call upon him, how will you be saved? You know, Yael, Acts chapter 2, Yael or Joel chapter 2 says, everyone who calls upon the name of Yahuwah will be delivered. Now, if you're calling upon the name of the Lord instead, and the word Lord translates directly into the Hebrew word B-A-A-L. B-A-A-L in the dictionary is defined as Lord. So if you're calling upon that, what? You know, did he say that? No. Hmm. We're supposed to obey, and we want to be correct, but... Hmm. Anyway, they <clears throat> we're not judging. We're just saying... This is what it says, and why is, why is it not being done in the world, you know? But um, if we were to skip along here and look at another frame, it says, uh, it's discussing the mind of the flesh as opposed to the mind of the spirit. Now, the spirit is Yahushua's presence in our heart, living in our bodies. You see, we're vessels, and we're empty vessels for his his operation. He comes in and we set, on, set off to the side with him and let him operate. And he makes all the choices and rightly divides the scriptures and says, well, this is a 
a commandment, we're going to do that. And we go, I'm all, I'm all for it. So you receive a love for the, for the commandments, you know, a love for his word. His word is the commandments. And if he's given us his instructions to live by, then we want to obey them when, he, when we have his spirit. But when we have a mind of the flesh and he's not in us, if he's not in our vessel, then we don't want anything to do with the commandments. They're oppressive and a lot of bother. They get in our way. They don't let us do what we want to do. So that's what we have to do, surrender our will and say, well, I don't want to do what I'm doing because that leads to death. That's what it says. I don't know what that means right now, but I want to obey it so that I don't go there. And so the mind of the Spirit is, is receiving Him and a love for His commandments is written on your hearts. Mm. And then you don't want to act the way you are. And you see things differently because He gives you the mind of the Spirit, meaning a viewpoint of the Spirit. It says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of Elohim dwells in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Messiah, this one is not his. Now that's Romans 8, verses 5 through 9. Now here's the thing. It just said in that little phrase right there, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of Elohim dwells in you. Now, the Spirit of Elohim, and then it says in the next verse, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Messiah, well, it's meaning that the Messiah is the same thing as the Spirit of Elohim. So there's not like two or three, uh, there's just one. And he identifies himself as the Spirit of Elohim, and he also means that, uh, the Spirit of the Messiah. So it, it, dwelling in their vessel, you know, that's amazing. Mm. Wow. But the mind of the Spirit um, enables us to obey. Yeah. There was one text that I thought was really interesting. We set our minds on the mind of the Spirit instead of the mind of the flesh. Now, the mind of the flesh is hatred toward Yahuwah because it does not subject itself to his Torah. That means his instructions. It will not subject itself. The mind of the flesh will not subject itself to the mind of of the spirit, because it, it it doesn't because it hates it, you know. And there's plenty of preachers that don't want anyone to submit to the Torah or the instructions of the and they tell us often. Yeah. They actually say it over and over and over. Oh, you don't want to obey because then you'll be a legalist. Meaning that you will be legal. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. See, the bride wants to be le legal because at Sinai she married well, Israel. The bride married Yahuwah at Sinai. All that you say, we will do and obey. And there it was, bam, acceptance. And uh, they were commanded to obey over and over. And uh, what happened was they, they failed to obey in this and that, and then they didn't keep the Sabbath, and they didn't let the land rest, and, and then he sent these people in uh, to, to torment them and sent them into the world, scattered them. And that is what he's talking about in that parable at Matthew chapter 13. The bride was taken out of the land and hidden as in a field long ago. Now, the field is the world, and the treasure in, buried in the field, which is the world, is the bride. It says, uh, Yahushua speaks and says, at verse 44 of Matthew 13, Again, the reign of the heavens is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man, found, having found it, hid, and for joy over it, goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, we know that it says that we were bought with a price, you see. He bought, he paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world, even though he bought the field. But there won't be everyone that'll accept that, you mm -hmm. know. They won't accept that he, he bought them. Mm -hmm. So they were scattered into the nations. 
And uh, our response was different from someone else's, that's all. And so now that we have, you know, understanding that we're his property, see, a bride is, in this case, it's an example, the bride is owned, and she still remains hidden in the field. And like, remember when Yosef in Egypt revealed himself to his brothers, and everybody was just so happy, they were crying? Well, Yahushua will one day reveal himself to his brothers, and that is going to be a day. <laughs> you know, what what do you think of that, man? Uh, when you know, I think it's in uh, Zechariah that talks about that. You know, yeah. you remember the text? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just amazing, isn't it? Yeah, can't wait. Now, uh, the first work of Yahusha when he came to the earth the first time, it involved atonement for sin. But the second work is going to be redemption, and that is going to be a day when he fully inhabits his bride. See, we've got a down payment of the Spirit right now, just a small token, a, a glimpse of what it's like to have his presence. But when he redeems us, he is going to completely fill each of us. And we won't even have any questions. We'll go, oh, I already know the answer to that. Oops, don't even have a question. There won't be any questions because his mind will be joined with ours. And right now he's just sent to seek and deliver that which was lost and to unite the house of Yehuda, which is the Jewish people and the, that ruling tribe you know, of uh, where all the kings come from with the house of Israel, you know, the lost tribes of Israel yeah. that never were ever regathered at, 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 at all. So that reunification is, I think, Yahushua's primary objective is to take the two houses of Israel, which divided, you know, under uh, after Solomon, you know, his, after his death, they divided. The north seceded from the south, and then Assyria came in later, sent them into dispersion, and then 130-something years later, the house of Judah was carried away. But a lot of the people were just dispersed, and all of them, didn't come back either. None of the ten tribes came back, and none of the uh, well, only ten percent of the uh, Yahudim came back. You know, from Babylon after seventy years. Mm. So you know, they're all sown into the nations, just like Amos nine verse nine says. Mm. But the uh, redemption actually occurs. The redemption when he. When everyone is raised from the dead that's going to be a member of the bride, and then the ones that are still alive, what the Catholics call the rapture, or the Protestants call the rapture, the, uh, the bride will end, I mean, the bride will actually uh, be redeemed. And that's the climactic ending to the Great Tribulation. See, a lot of people think that, and they're taught by their preachers, that what happens is there's a rapture, and it just happens. And then the Great Tribulation ensues, and that's the way he protects them. He has to get them out. But you see, that's not exactly right, because we're going to be changed, you know, in the twinkling of an eye, and, and we'll be protected from the things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And then we will meet him in the air, that's true. However, during the Great Tribulation, we're going to remain here, you know. Hmm. And I know that we'd like to get the timing right, but uh, yeah. and we know that he's our husband. Hmm. Because Isaiah, or Yeshua 54, verse 5 says, For your maker is your husband. Yahuwah of hosts is his name. He just told us his name. Hmm. And the set-apart one of Yisrael is your redeemer. He is called the Elohim of all the earth. So how many redeemers do we have? Well, <laughs> we only have one. This one. The husband is Yahushua. That's what he wants us to call him right now because he's our deliverer. That's what his name means. Yah is our deliverer. Redeem it, and he redeems his bride at the end, at the time of the great shout, really, the last trumpet, a fulfillment of one of the festivals. Of the seventh month. And that's ignored by Christianity. Mm. Anyway, the feast, the feast of Sukkoth, 
which is also called the Feast of Tabernacles, is when we're actually taken into the household. You know, when a Jewish couple is married, they get underneath this little tent called the kupa, and that represents the sukkah, you know, the little household. It's just a household that it represents. And the sukkah every year, this, the festival of tabernacles, is going to be, uh, it's going to happen for real one time, because right now it's a foreshadowing. It's a shadow of something, of things to come. And it's a redemption part of it. It's the last one in seven redemption phases. And it starts with Passover, and it ends with us going into the tent. Hmm. When we're actually joined, we actually, it's going to be a future festival of Sukkah. Hmm. And uh, he's already chosen his bride, but he has not yet taken full possession of her. And that's when we go into the wedding supper. So the wedding supper is actually an, uh, predicted by the festival of, of Sukkot, or Tabernacles. Hmm. And it's a future festival of Sukkoth that we're looking forward to. And it's a harvest festival because, you know, the harvest of the earth involves, not, he's not going to come down here and, and, and there's not going to be a bunch of messengers come down and with sickles and start reaping wheat and corn. He's talking about us, you know. But the ones that are, you know, actually taken first, that's the, the bad ones. Mm. So out of the midst of the righteous, the unrighteous will be taken out. The wicked will be removed first, and then the wheat will be gathered. So the pressure that's going to happen from the bowls that are going to be unleashed are, is going to eliminate the wicked. There will be ashes under our feet, and, the, and we will be there when it happens. Hmm. We're not going to be somewhere else. Well, how would that be? Hmm. Anyway, so you think they? Um, you think they may not just? They won't just lift it out. That it'll it'll happen during all the plagues and everything. Yeah, the seven plagues are going to wipe out a lot of people. Uh, Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter sixty six is an interesting text. It talks about those that are eating the flesh of pigs that are going to be uh, finding themselves in a world of hurt because Yahuwah says, in that day, he's going to destroy many. For that reason, you know, because mm. they rejected his instructions. Mm. But uh, do you think that um, tribulation everything will go for a literal three and a half years, like a lot of them say, like because of the other half of the prophecy, Daniel's prophecy, all that sort of thing? What do you think? Well, that's uh, not asking you to say in a <laughs> pin well, down not, number. <laughs> everybody can understand that. Yeah, but. See, when we start saying this is the way it's going to be and that's the mm -hmm. way it's going to be, uh, who are we? You know, <laughs> we're, yeah. just, we're just supposed to watch. Mm -hmm. He didn't say we're supposed to interpret, but he yeah. said watch so that you will know when it happens. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, well, we, we are going to know and recognize it. But we also can see that there's three and a half like millennia, you know, that we can look at too. So you can look at this thing on different scales. Because a lot of the things he's doing are like on different levels, you know, different scales of years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I do tend to believe that there's going to be, he's interrupted the seven-day week, uh, in, not the week that we live in, but the, the, the seven, uh, you know, the redemption. in the redemption plan. Uh, in the book of Daniel, it talks about uh, there's going to be an end of sacrifice, and that did occur. The uh, sacrifice stopped, and I believe it was on the Day of Atonement that it was evident that that happened in the uh, year that Yahushua died, because the, uh, the 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 goat, you know, the scapegoat, was, uh, you know, there was something about the, uh, the ribbon that was put on the door of the temple that was supposed to change colors, and it did not change back. It changed from red to white, they say, and. That year that he died, it didn't do that. That's in the Talmud, of course. And they haven't figured that one out yet. But uh, mm. the whole temple's taken away. So the temple and the, and the whole operation of the temple was stopped. Mm. So the three and a half days that preceded that had, had come to an end. 
And then the last three and a half days that have yet to start up again are, uh, you know, they're still yet ahead. But we could look at that as a, as a separate topic. But, and there's people that do study that. And they really get into some fine little points, which is wonderful. But, uh, you know, it's all out, outside of our, uh, our reign or our decisions, whatever it happens to be. When we start looking at things in a, in a closed way, that's when we really get into some serious trouble, you know. Mm. You know, we start getting different opinions than others. And I understand the opinions, uh, and I like them all. It's just that which one is going to be real? See, I mean, that's uh, all in prophecy, and all these things are going to be manifested when they happen, and then we'll look back and reflect on them, and we'll say, wow, see how that worked out? That's marvelous, you know. So that's what I'm really looking forward to, is sitting around and talking and saying, did you, did you notice how that situation worked itself out? And we were all worried about it, and it was maybe nothing like we expected. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I'm waiting for. But, uh, mm -hmm. but anyway, the um, First Thessalonians talks about uh, something to do with, you know, the... Uh, Feast of Trumpets, the first day of the seventh month, one of these years, there's going to be a, a shout of the archangel, and, and the trumpet of Yahuwah is going to be blasted. It says uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 13, Now, brothers, we do not wish you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you be sad as others who have no expectation. For if we believe that Yahushua died and rose again, so also Elohim shall bring with him those who sleep in Yahushua. For this we say to you by the word of the Master, that we, the living who are left over, at the coming of the Master, shall in no way go before those who are asleep, because the Master himself shall come down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of a chief messenger, and with the shofar of Elohim, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. Then we, the living who are left over, shall be caught away together with them in the clouds to meet the master in the air. And so we shall always be with the master. So encourage one another with these words. That's interesting because that word caught away in that text is the word harpazo, which means to raptus. It's the Latin word raptus. But the Greek word is harpazo, and it means to snatch away. And it actually refers to a very fast or very quick seizing, a grabbing of a of, uh, his people, you know. It's interesting that they've they've taken this is one of the texts that they use to back up their pre-trib rapture, and yet it says those that those who are left over shall be caught away; those who are left over shall be caught away together with them. It doesn't say those who are taken first; those who are left over. Then they're mis said, misinterpreting their own text. Yeah, it says those who are left over. Now, uh, the first cursory reading of that would mean other than the ones that were raised, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It might mean after these other people are fried, the ones that are left over, mm. having not been harmed because they were sealed with the Father's name, as Revelation explains, and of course many others, uh, and well, particularly Malachi chapter 3. You know, which we haven't read. We should read that. Well, let's see. I might be able to find that here. Malachi chapter 3. Yeah, I don't think it was in the broad study. It's important, though. Yeah. No, it was. You know, he's always talking about uh, getting Israel to obey his commandments. And he's talking about that in the early part of the chapter. And uh, he's talking about bringing in the tithe, which is food. And he says, uh, and starting in Malachi 3, verse 16, Then those who fear Yahuwah speak to one another, and Yahuwah listen and hear, and a book of remembrance be written before him of those who fear Yahuwah and those who think upon his name. And they shall be mine, said Yahuwah of hosts, on the day that I prepare a treasured possession 
and I shall spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again see the difference between the righteous and the wrong, between one who serves Elohim and one who does not serve him. So there's a distinction being made there. And we need to be able, as the bride, we need to be able to know if we're keeping his commandments or if we're keeping the commandments and traditions of men, which is the principal problem Yahushua had with the religious people of his day. They were obeying men rather than the commandments. And of course, we're in trouble for that. Has your, um, do you think the concept of fear has changed? Do you fear Yahuwah or is your... Or by the standards of what we would say fear is, or do you think it's more, do you operate more under a loving relationship? Well, the fear in the sense of the Hebrew is to have great, really, the highest respect for. Uh, it, it, has, it, it does mean also to be afraid, but it more importantly means are you afraid enough to obey? Uh, but it isn't out of fear that we obey. Because you see, the power is not in fear. The power is in love. So if we fear, then it's a, an emotional condition. But love is act actively helping to see something through because we see it His way. And we live that way because we understand what His will is. Because we want to do His will. It's like the parable of the two sons that, well, one said, uh, yes, Father, I'm going to go do what you, what you will. You told me to go out into the field and work in your vineyard. And the other one said, no, Father, I don't really want to do your will today. But later on, he changed his mind. And the one that said he would do his will changed his mind, didn't. And the one that said he would not do it because he had other things on his mind, you know how we are. And then we, he repented and said, I'm going to do it. And then he did his father's will. And Yahushua said, which one did the will of the father? Or the, did he do his own will? You know. So the mind of the spirit is the key to this whole thing. You either get his mind in you because he offers it to you. He, he's, he's standing at the door knocking. And all you have to do is go, wonder who that is. Oh, I know who that is. Now, wait a minute. If I open that, that, that door, He's going to come in, and then I'm going to have to do things his way. Well, that's right. We open the door. He comes in. We welcome him because he is life. And we say, please come in. I'm going to die. I've got leprosy. I've got all these problems. I, I'm not going to live forever. But if you come into my, uh, my vessel, then I'm going to live forever. And you will give me your life. And that's all we're really saying. You know, the bride wants people to know that. You know, you just let him in. Stop this nonsense. It's mm. selfish. Mm. That's wonderful. <laughs> now, let's see what we have next. Uh, it talks about the people who fall asleep in Messiah. The dead rise first. Then we, the living, are caught away together with them in the clouds. And, of course, sleep is a, meta, a, a euphemism for death. But the word caught away in that text is the same Greek word used at Acts 8.39, harpazo, to seize. And the Latin word is raptus, as in seizing property. And we're enabled by the Spirit. Well, no, uh, Philip was teleported in Acts chapter 8. He was harpazoed. He was seized and taken away. <laughs> taken away. I'm hitting the green screen. The elbow uh, through his, his backdrop. <laughs> oh, what's that hole? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, uh, Philip was talking to the Ethiopian eunuch that was going back to Ethiopia. And uh, he was a pretty high-ranking fellow that had gone to the festival. And uh, Philip went down there and explained the text of Yeshayahu to him, or Isaiah 53. And uh, after he was done immersing with him, he went on his way, and Philip just went, doink! He was somewhere else instantly. You know, yeah, people, yeah. People don't realize if we if we just sort of calm down a bit and listen, like who should just? I'm not saying he'll necessarily transport us to the other side of the world, but I'm just saying he, he sort of orchestrates everything, doesn't he? You you'll run into people who 
And they'll go, we were only thinking that this morning, and then we ran into you. Like, How did that happen? Is that coincidence? And like, it, it happens all the time, doesn't it? If you're it's the mind of the spirit. Yeah, the mind of the spirit is in his people. He's telling us all the same thing at the same time. Mm. You know. Amazing. So, uh, you know, the Ten Maidens uh, talks about that a little bit in this next screen here. The Ten Maidens seem to correspond to the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. You know, some of them are going to listen and act take the oil, you know, the oil being, you know, the spirit, the life of Yahusha himself into their vessels. You know, it's interesting that a lamp, which we understand now as a heart, it's our hearts, and our, our, our wineskins. It's another, you know, they're, they're code words. Wineskin, lamp, heart, just the same thing. Anyway, what goes into our lamp is either false teachings, or it's him bringing the new wine, being oil, the thing that we can show to the world through our behavior, the light. Of course, he's the light, but the light of a lamp is, is the oil. You know, in fact, sometimes in Hebrew, the word oil refers to the light that results. You know, I, can, I think it's Zechariah chapter 6. But uh, some have wisdom and some have prepared themselves more than others. And the oil that is discussed, the, the oil in the lamp, it actually represents the guidance of Yahushua's spirit, helping make the wise maidens aware of what is needed to prepare for themselves for the abrupt arrival of the bridegroom. Because the, the wedding feast is an exclusive affair. So uh, the Christian understanding our, of our redemption is partly correct, but it will occur at the end of the Great Tribulation. That's because, you know, it says that, you know, if you read it, it. The Great Tribulation is something that we have to go through, and that way a lot of people will be delivered because we're there. Our greatest work, in fact, will be done during that period. So we'll be redeemed at the same time that we're regathered. See, the regathering of the tribes of Israel will be occurring at the time that he comes back. And the lost tribes, or the lost, are not sealed with his name. And they'll, you know, a lot of those will be helped greatly because we're still there. Anyway, uh, I guess we talked to, uh, we talked enough about the rapture. That's another subject, though. You know, but it, doesn't, it is involved, though, in this study. But that's something we can go into. In fact, we have, a, what is it, the, the, the two resurrections yes. deals with that. And I think we have a, a separate study on the rapture, too. Mm. Yeah. But uh, from Yahushua's point of view, which is the only point of view we need to have, see, everybody in the world is sinking into oblivion and the grave will ultimately consume all of us without his intervention. Mm -hmm. So that's why he's acting. And that's why we are so enthusiastic and so compelled to say something. Because he's doing that through us. See, he operates in our vessels to get his will done. You know, He's not trying to convert you to a denomination. He's trying to get you to wake up and realize that reality and not religion is going to face every one of us. And our wanton dependence upon him every instant is pushing aside in our daily, is pushing aside in our daily lives. Anyway, uh, if we could just uh, look at it from his point of view, because then we would pr be pretty uh, concerned about people, you know. Mm. Yeah. But every denomination on the planet Every religious denomination believes itself to be the bride, and we're and, and they're ahead of all the others. And uh, he's and Yahushua is a way, like he said he would be, to receive the kingdom, and to prepare a place for his bride. And those who await his return are partly wise and partly foolish. So you know what are we doing? We're we're feeding the household. In, in, in season, you know. And, you, you know, when people hear the word season when they're Christians, they don't know what that means. But 
in the in season, it usually means at the appointed times, you know, the Moedim, because uh, the the sun and the and, and the moon were created for signs and seasons, and the word Moedim is involved. Mm -hmm. Oh, one text that I think is really great. Uh, let me find out what this text is from. Deuteronomy chapter 4, of course. Deuteronomy chapter 4. In, in fact, we put that on our, on our cards, our little, uh, you know, our little cards. Yeah. On the back of the card, we refer to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and it says, In your distress, that's the great tribulation, when all these words, he's talking about the covenant, the Ten Commandments, come upon you in the latter days, then you shall return to Yahuwah your Elohim and shall obey his voice. Now he doesn't say that you're going to go somewhere. He's not talking about return to Yahuwah by moving back to the land of Israel. He's going to regather us there. And then when we lie down, there will be no one to ever harm us. It's not happening yet. But when he regathers us, it's going to be a great, it's going to be the second exodus is what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. But he says we're in the latter days that we will return to Yahuwah in our heart and obey his voice. So we're going to obey where we are while we're scattered. See, we're scattered right now. You're on the, uh, in the southern hemisphere and I'm in the, in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. And neither one of us are in the land, so we haven't seen the regathering yet. And then another place in Deuteronomy 30, at the end of the book nearly, it says, And it shall be when all these words come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you shall bring them back to your heart among all the Gentiles where Yahuwah your Elohim drives you, and shall turn back to Yahuwah your Elohim and obey his voice. According to all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your being, you and your children, then Yahuwah your Elohim shall turn back your captivity and shall have compassion on you, and he shall turn back and gather you from all the peoples where Yahuwah your Elohim has scattered you. And that's what we're talking about, you know. Isn't that it? Yeah. That's it. You know, Deuteronomy 30. He starts out talking about it in Deuteronomy 4, and then he completes the whole idea in Deuter after all the blessings and the curses for not obeying the commandments. Then he says these things are going to come upon you, and then you will obey, and then he's going to gather you. Mm -hmm. And if any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under the heavens, from there, Yahuwah your Elohim does gather you. And from there, he does take you. And that word take is lechach, which means to seize. <laughs> and that's that's another one. You know, we're really talking a lot about the rapture here. But it does involve that, you know, yeah. the harpazo, the uh, lechach, you know, yeah. or lechash, or lechach, I think it is. It's uh, three Hebrew word, uh, letters, but it means to seize. And they shall know that I am Yahuwah, their Elohim, who sent them into exile among the Gentiles and then gathered them back to their own land and left none of them behind. And no longer do I hide my face from them, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Master Yahuwah. Now that's Ezekiel 39, verses 28 and 29. And the book of Ezekiel, or Yehezkel, is all about the scattering and then the regathering. The whole book it's all about that. That's the topic. Wow. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, people are wondering a lot of little details like, uh, well, why is it that they were scattered? And why were they scattered for this particular time, the length of time? And, of course, those things are mathematically tied to things like Ezekiel chapter 4, where he's told to lay on his side and for a number of days and lay on his other side. And one side was related to the house of Israel, and the other side was related to the house of Yehuda, and that was to define their, the time of their captivity, a day for a year, and then that relates back to a law in Leviticus chapter 26, 
if you don't repent within the span of time, then you're going to get, it's going to hit you sevenfold, you know. And those are all mathematical things that you can work out, but the reasoning is there. So the legal precedent is established for why we're in captivity and for how long, hmm. you know. So the bride, then it's lifted. Then it's lifted. But, you know, we, we figure that it was around the, ha the last parts of the House of Israel, the northern tribes, went into captivity around the year 722 BCE, which was uh, over 2,800 years ago, or 2,700 something years ago. So the dispersion, it was a long, long time ago. But we're now seeing people aware of what's happened. And now we're regathering to the covenant, and we're arguing about things like uh, when it's when a day starts, and whether or not the moon sets the week, and whether or not uh, you know all these little things. Uh, we're really messed up, and we need to overcome those problems and false teachings, and get back and look at the older brother and say, "Well, you've been doing this for thousands of years. What is it that we're doing? That, I mean, how are we going to get reunited?" You know, Yahusha in us wants us to reunite with the older brother, you know, not with the uh, Roman uh, circuits or, uh, you know, some denomination. You know. Mm. But it's all about Israel, his bride, you know. Mm. His bride comes out of Israel, you know, the first fruits anyway, you know. The first fruits is the bride. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's... Let's see, who is Yahushua married to? Well, he's married to Israel, scripturally, you know. But the uh, circus is uh, married to another, not married to Yahuwah. They would like to be, but they don't know what they're doing, see. Uh, let's see, Jer Jer Jeremiah chapter 16, is it? Yes. Yeah, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, see, the days are coming, declares Yahuwah, when it is no longer said Yahuwah lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Israel, but Yahuwah lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. And then it says, for I shall bring them back into their land I gave to their fathers. See, I am sending for many fishermen, declares Yahuwah, and they shall fish them. And after that I shall send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. So we're going to be restored to the covenant, you know, and he's going to bring, them, bring us back to the land too. But he will do that, not us, you know. Because we've inherited nothing but lies and, fa and falsehood, you know, as far as from our fathers, you know. Mm. And now we're awakening to his covenant. Anyway, the uh, interesting thing is, the fortress that we are going to become, this cube that's described in Revelation, is actually uh, similar to the uh, camp of Israel, you know. Remember the camp of Israel when they were set up in the wilderness? It corresponds to that. Wow. It'll be a, a fortress, a spiritual fortress. So, um, and and as far as whether we're the bride, whether the bride is regathered or not, let's look at this. There's a scripture here, uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 43, that Yahushua says, "Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father." And that's uh, what that's when we're get regathered. That's the new Yerushalayim. We are the new Yerushalayim, you know. Mm. Yeah, I'd never until we'd met you. We'd never heard that it was even a cube. We really, yeah. And yet, that's what the scripture says. It's like, yeah. Isn't it? There's a text that says it's um, it's equal. It's like a cube. Dimensions are like a cube. Yeah. Well, the, there's a, a lot of people that have known this. Uh, temple that we are, we're actually the third temple. The uh, first temple was destroyed by uh, Nebuchadnezzar, 
and then the second temple was destroyed in the year 70 CE by uh, Titus, the Roman uh, general. And the uh, third temple is made without hands because we are the dwelling place of Yahuwah. You know, and uh, a lot of people are waiting for a third temple built with human hands. But, uh, you know, I'm not really looking for that. Because that would mean a reestablishment of the sacrifices. And uh, I don't know that Yahoo is going to allow that. Yeah, apparently they're breeding certain animals, you know, and doing all sorts of things, uh, getting ready for that, aren't they? Well, yeah, and that's all part of uh, what was already stopped. Why would, if, if Yahuwah wanted to reinitiate all that again, why would, why would he uh, have destroyed the, the first two? And then talk about a third, uh, uh, you know, him indwelling his people. Because, see, the whole thing points to him indwelling his people. So, you know, it's just not what Scripture seems to illustrate. But, uh, of course, people that read Ezekiel are going to find a way to make it work. Of course, if it does work, if it happens, uh, I'm in full agreement. <laughs> if they start building a temple and all the uh, Muslim people just say, Wow, that looks great. Well, let's let's just do that, you know. <laughs> but um, you know, right now, I think that the land is being trampled underfoot by heathen. But uh, you know, the thing of it is, if if some by some chain of odd effects uh, happen, and the fact that the United Nations brought the Yahudim back to the land, and it was the United Nations that did that. It was not Yahuwah, but then he allowed it, so he's still sovereign. But, you know, the United Nations allowed for them to come back to the land, and then immediately they were attacked, you know, and they've been under attack. Um, but if uh, suddenly the Temple Mount is uh, taken, and they start building a temple there, and all the Muslims are just standing back going, you know, it's just not worth it. Let's just watch this. This is interesting. But, you know, the, the dragon doesn't want that to be done. You know, when they came back from uh, Babylon, the dragon had sent all kinds of trouble, you know, when they were trying to rebuild the walls and reestablish the city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, there was all sorts of adversarial problems. They had to work with a, a trowel in, in one hand and a weapon in the other, you know. Yeah. But uh, that's pretty much the way it would be now. Yeah. If they were to start building a temple, they'd say, well, let's put this stone in. Oh, well, what's that? Boink. You know, <laughs> they have to. Yeah. But, uh, and for what? You know, to, to, yeah. to start the sacrifices up again? Yeah. Because they won't accept Yahushua's sacrifice. You know, the blood of the lamb has been slain. Uh, you know, he's been slain. The blood covers our hearts. He sprinkled our hearts with his with 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 his blood. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, there's one sacrifice, you know, to end all, you know, yeah. that as far as for sin, you know. Of course, there's going to be uh, other slaughterings that are going to be in the millennium that that will actually participate uh, in because they're going to be like family picnics, barbecues, you know. They're going to be fun fun times. Mm -hmm. Fun times for all around. You know, we're going to be uh, just have a great time. Why are they called slaughterings in the future? Well, the, in the future, there's going to be um, love gifts, offerings. Uh, I see. Free will offerings, uh, but not not for sin. No. Not for sin. Mm. So yeah. it's uh, it's going to be you know a joyous thing you know, and. Uh, I have a lot of questions too, but of course when we're indwelled completely, yeah. we're not going to have that many questions, are we? Because yeah. we'll know him as he and see him as he is, and each one of us will, will possess his his mind fully, or really more like his mind will possess our vessels fully, and then we will we will be a lot less in control of ourselves than we are now. Which would be great. We could just flip a switch and say, "Well, that's it. All of it. 
take it off. But you see, that's not yet the way it is. So mm -hmm. there's a flat man here. Oh no! I thought it was a. <laughs> Not be the thing. Did you see a flat? I, I thought I saw something fly past. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. that's the first fly we've seen this year, which is really amazing. You're getting warm there, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's the sixth month of the Roman calendar here. And that's uh, in Fahrenheit, it's in the uh, 80s. Wow. During that's pretty hot. Well, the Fahrenheit, though, that sounds yeah. like it's about to boil to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be that'd be about thirty of thirty, thirty five, forties for us, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty hot. Yeah. Well, it's zero here, so <laughs> it's freezing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Zero is freezing. Yeah, and one hundred degrees is boiling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, I don't have a conversion chart here to see what eighty right. two would be, but. Yeah. You know, 82 Fahrenheit, you know, it's uh, it's not that uncomfortable. Oh, see, our, our bodies are at 98.6 Fahrenheit. Okay. That's, uh, so if it gets up anywhere near our body temperature, it, it gets really uncomfortable. Well, do you have enough here to... Oh, yeah, yeah. We discussed the, the new Yerushalayim and the, oh, there's the ball cube. That was funny. Uh, yeah. The board cube. They always all the movies now. They're just insane, aren't they? They're always copying. You watch them and you go, "Oh yeah, heard that before." Oh, where did I hear that? Oh yeah, Torah. <laughs> it's in it. Everything they use now is in Torah. They probably don't know that themselves, though. Then you got your living stones. We're all living stones. That's interesting because we're all, you know, all rough and rubbing together to prepare ourselves to be the. In the quarry, that's what we're always taught. We're all in the quarry and we're all rough, and we can't be used as living stones until we've rubbed up against each other and you know, yeah. got, got rid of all our issues. And you know, we're smooth and shining, and we can be put into the to the foundation. Yeah. So. Well, you know, when we speak, when we go through these times that we're living in now. Uh, we'll look back on them and say, well, I'm glad that I was there to to do what I did because Yahushua's trying to get the wrinkles out of his bride so that they'll learn how to love one another and love him. And uh, he even wants us to love our enemies. You know? So, you know, if we can't if we can't love the one that we can see, like he said, and, well, it was Paul who wrote that, how can we possibly Love him who we haven't seen, or was that John? John uh, Yahoo can it? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's in there somewhere. Yeah, it's in there. Mm. But that's an interesting thing because you're reading scripture, and and they and then in the, in the scriptures it says it's written somewhere uh, about this, and it talks about it, yeah. but they don't really mention where, you know. Yeah, and, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, the new Jerusalem, that's uh, oh, amazing. That's going to be a thing to see, isn't it? So, it's like it's going to be a cube, and yet in another verse it says that it's going to be us. So, is it a cube or is it us? It's one well, of those. I'm, <laughs> I'm towards it being us. Yeah. The dwelling place that he's gone away to prepare for us, he says there's many dwelling places. And I see that as the new body that we're going to have because we'll be, of course, the description of the environment is given, too, that we live in. But, um, you know, these are uh, yet to be seen because, you know, it said no eye has seen what he has prepared for those who love him. So we've got to uh, expect mostly him because we're not looking at us. You know, I mean, what, whatever we will be, we will be like him. So, but he's going to be in the midst of us, and in the midst of us, literally in the vessels. But we will be able to come and go out of this large object. I think it's going to be made up of us, though, mm -hmm. filled with him. Of course, each one of us. Mm -hmm. So, we're, if, if one of the little uh, people, like you or me or someone, goes out of the gate, then he's still there. 
in them and going out to do something and going out work. And then, but um, yeah, I, I kind of think of the, like you said, the, it says that the bride, the new Jerusalem, is adorned as a bride. And, uh, and that would mean probably that it is the bride, you know, hmm. made up of the bride, the living stones. We are all living stones made up to become the temple that he indwells, you know. Hmm. Wow. Whatever that might look like, uh, we, we do know that it did have a measurement. But of course, if there is another physical thing that we live within too, that's fine. Because we are accustomed to, you know, our bodies and then living in a, in a, another, in a larger structure. So that's fine too, you know. But, you know, these expectations, are, it's just a wonderful thing to think about. Yeah. That it's going to be marvelous. I mean, we can't even imagine. You know, mm. we're going to be so happy. And yeah. If we if we haven't been arguing too much with one another, you know, and yeah. you know, if I bump into anybody and I and I say, "Oh my, I never got a chance to really apologize to you for the way I treated you," yeah. uh, and I don't know who it would be, but I would I would still go up to them even if I hadn't been said. So, I'm so sorry about it, you know, whatever the problem was. But, uh, you know, that's the way I feel now. But then we're all going to feel even more so, you know. Yeah. We're going to say, well, what were we thinking? You know, mm -hmm. how could we have been so cruel to one another mm -hmm. as we were? When the redemption is so great for each and every one of us, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, so wonderful. Yeah, it's a good thing to look forward to. Keep our eyes on you, Isha. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic, mate. <laughs> well, how's, how's all the family? They're all fine. Yeah. Everybody's fine. That's I do have a brother that I'm praying for. He's uh, about one year younger than me, and he had a problem uh, a week or so ago that put him in the hospital, and he's home now. But he still has a collapsed lung, and he's just uh, not real, really doing well. He's on oxygen because he only has one lung now. So we hope that he recovers fully. You know, if anybody wants to pray for him, his name is Ralph. You know, I don't see Ralph. He's living in another city far away, and it's been years since I've seen him. So. But everybody in the family is doing pretty well. And the mayoress? <laughs> the what? The mayoress. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, she's good. Yeah, the mayoress. Um, Are you talking about uh, Phyllis as the, being the mayor? <laughs> oh, the mayor. that little scenario that they do. Yeah. <laughs> On Facebook. Yeah. yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's really taught me so much. Just opened my eyes completely. Yeah, the main thing is that we don't judge one another. You yeah. know, because yeah. we're that's not our job. We don't use the Torah as a club or a uh, means of judging. We just are told to teach it and to live according to it and to not worry about what somebody else's eye sees, but just you know, look at Yahusha. And when we're looking at him, there's not a problem. You know, we're all tuned to that that one instrument, our head. But when if you've got a body and the head is there, uh, and you've got fingers that are having an argument with the other fingers or the toes, the head's going, What's going on? You know. <laughs> you have a different function than that does. See, that's where I'm a lot misunderstood is uh they don't know what I'm doing. Yahusha is doing something through me that is is for me, and they're doing something different. And they're looking over, and going, "What? Well, what's that? You know, what do you mean? You know, what what what's wrong? Oh, I'm upset by what you're doing. Well, uh, what is it I'm doing? What, what does it concern you? How does it concern you? You know, 
you're supposed to be listening to the head. And all of that's, mis all that's, you know, using up my time and their time, all this busybody stuff, you know. I'm not condemning or judging anyone for that. I'm just saying mm -hmm. you need to stay on task because mm -hmm. the dragon loves it when we get off the task. Mm -hmm. If we can be distracted, taken away, I couldn't tell you how many hours have been wasted for uh, having to go back and stop what I'm doing and go and attend to some poor person that's been injured by some slander. Either mine or, or slander about me or slander about someone else. You know, if you hear someone starting up talking about someone else, oh, did you hear this? Okay, stop right there. <laughs> that's the wrong thing for me to hear. Let's, let's move on. Let's talk to some, about him. Put your eyes on, the, on, on Yahushua again. Get your eyes off of one another. You know. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. It, it destroys the, the hearer as well as the person that's being spoken about. Mm. Because the hearer is also participating in the slanderous activity. Mm. And, you know, it's one of those things on the list you who hates is slander. And that uh, is what we often hear. I will, you know, when I pick up a stronghold that I want to help straighten out people with, whether it's this or that, like, for example, the new thing that's starting to rear its ugly head is the, the day spring doctrine. This idea that the day starts at the morning and nighttime doesn't even count or, or it's a 24-hour day, daylight to daylight day. Those kinds of things, I'm not going to mention anybody's name and say, this person started this. I know who started it, but I'm not going to drag their name through the mud mm -hmm. because that's wrong. It's the teaching that's wrong, but we, had, we don't want to drag one another down. Mm -hmm. We always want to uplift one another and teach others to uplift one another. Put others above you as if you were below them. So that you, even if you think you're right, you don't push them down in order to push yourself up. Mm. It's not the way he would do it. Yeah. You should, he laid his life down for all of us. Mm. While we're arguing about in the room which one's the greatest, he's washing our feet. Mm. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And you know, just wake up to that and see him in the room with you when you're when you're seeing this stuff going on. It's, mm. Where's Yahusha? Oh, he's washing our feet. Mm. You, know, yeah. you know, that's the thing. See? Mm. The, thing just, the thing I've noticed by, um, like, over the years, I've never really wanted to go online. I've always just been doing video work. But And the things that I would see people say or do, I've always sort of had this fear and uh, never wanted to confront anything or not liking to, you know, um, face things or and I'd find that I, I would immediately start judging and get angry so therefore I would not want to step in and I'll just go back to my work you know which is great keep going with the work but I I've found that lately that I'm getting a, a sort of a joy about like I'm being taught how to face things like I found I was really we're not supposed to be judging and angry at each other inside ourselves and I found that that's how I've always operated been really angry and um now I'm finding, through this whole dodge thing, I'm just finding that it's like a child, it's like a, if the behavior, if you don't see the fruit, then why are you getting your feathers ruffled? It's like, it's all about love. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I guess I haven't, I'm being exercised in an area I've never been asked to go. And I'm, we're going to have to go into the world and talk to people and, get our feathers ruffled at times, I guess, and if we can't handle it, I'm, I mean, I'm, you know, now, and that's the thing the sheriff's been saying to me, <laughs> just, how can you take any of this serious, Mark? <laughs> Why aren't you laughing? It's so hilarious. So I just realised that it's just, it's just, people are so dear and so sweet and so lovely, but the behaviours that are surrounding everybody is just so hilarious that, I'm happy to say I'm in a school. I'm just being taught how to behave because, uh, you know, I've never known how to. So it's, uh, to me, it's been an amazing eye-opening experience just to to see that if there's not love there, 
why are we debating all these issues when there's no love in the in the conversation? Yahushua should be first and forefront and the fruit of our love towards one another. That's what I'm discovering. And if it's not there, how can we take it serious? Yeah, the goal is love. And if we miss the goal, I mean all the things that we can do that are right, you know, you could you know what is it? First uh, Corinthians chapter thirteen. Mm. You could know all things. You could have everything right and know everything there is to know. And then if you don't have love, it's mm. pointless. You know. Mm. He'll, he, he will throw us away. Mm. Go out into the outer darkness right along with the sinners. If we don't have love, if we don't see the goal, mm. we have to see that. We can be wrong about things, but if we have love and we've, we're aiming at the right thing, and these little issues that people get upset about, you know, uh, we know that there's going to be new ones all along. I mean, I, I was talking about that uh, a few weeks ago. I said, I wonder what the next thing's going to be. Well, it's their strongholds. And that's why he's enabled us to take on the strongholds, but not take on the people themselves. It's not the people. Because our enemy is not flesh and blood, mm. and our weapons are not carnal weapons. They're, they're for the tearing down of strongholds, mm. false reasons, you know, false reasonings and um, ideas that are not true. You know, they're just thought to be true, and they're believed, but they're not necessarily at all true. But if we can just expose them one by one, as they come down the line, we'll just say, that's a lie. Why is it a lie? Because the truth, which is the word, tells us what truth is. And the truth doesn't need to be defended because it's, it's on its own. It's the foundation. It doesn't have to worry about something coming along and blowing it away because we can blow away the errors. Mm. And when we point things out to them and, and then they say, oh, well, that's an exception. And look, that's another exception. Well, it's because they're they're defined by their by their error. You know, they're always saying something over and over and over, and they can't ever get off the topic that their heresy is embodying. You know, mm. that's the topic that defines them. Yeah. We have a lot of topics that we cover. You mm. know, I don't know which one it is that defines us, but what would it be? Uh, Probably the. the the name yeah. and the word. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> because we're, we're uh, striving to be doing the will of Yahusha and him operating in our vessels so that he can do what he needs to do from where we are so that we can actually teach the name and the word. You know, mm. and let, the, let the people deal with it. You know, every time we have a seminar, we read the Ten Commandments in a translation. And I even define some of the words themselves from the Hebrew so that it helps people understand the nature of what the commandment really asks us to do. If the commandment is on his name, then we use his name and, and explain why he said what he said. You know. but, and then there's the Sabbath book. You know, the fourth commandment. So, you know, these are the things that he wants to express to the whole world. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, a, a time coming when a messenger is going to cry out, fear him who made the heavens and the earth and the mm -hmm. springs and fountains of water. Uh, and they're not doing it, you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, he's going to, it's going to start something. And that's going to be the last uh, chance that people will have before his return and their utter annihilation. Mm. Mm. Uh, well. well. Well, it's been lovely chatting to you, mate. Missed you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, we've had a good long visit, though. You yeah. Know, about an hour and a half. Hour and a half. Not sure where we'll go next. I had to take the lamp uh, study off uh, the old uh, off the old Torah Institute channel this week because uh, I don't know there must have been issues with it. Too many movies or something. So, really? Yeah. So that's been taken off. So there's 
there's nothing online about the lamp, so maybe we could go there next time. Wow, that would be great. Let's mm. do that. Because the lamp, it's, uh, it contains a lot of information that people need to know. And so many people are going on about the soul and the spirit and the body and all these parts. They did three or four parts that they think we are. And so the, yeah. that, you cover all that in that study, so that would be interesting for everyone. Yeah, uh, we simplified it to, uh, yeah, the two components that we're made up of. Mm. But, uh, yeah, let's just do that. Maybe uh, next month we'll just plan on that. Mm. And that'll dovetail in with the, uh, mm. the, la the new seminar that isn't yet up. You know, possessed. Yeah. All right, brother. Will you enjoy the rest of your Sabbath? You too. And uh, well, your Sabbath's over, but you enjoy your day. Yep. So okay. say hello to everybody and tell them all that, that I love them and we love them. We'll do. Okay. Well, we'll see you. Love you, mate. Love you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise. How wonderful is it to be delivered? Do you feel how much Yahushua loves you? If you're watching this, then you're being called by your Creator. He's wooing you, whispering in your ear to come, come all you who are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. I will lift your burdens, for I'm Yahushua. I'm Yahuwah who heals you. I'm the one who delivers. I see what you've been through. I've heard your cries. If you've truly had enough of the wicked beast system that controls this world, then come to me. Come and be grafted into the branches, the olive trees. Become a witness, a hunter, a watchman, a Torah teacher. If you thought you were part of the bride, but you now realize you're not, then take the necessary steps. Repent for your lawlessness and ignorance. Get immersed into the only saving name of Yahushua HaMashiach and enter the bride company. Yahushua will lead you and guide you to the rest with his wonderful word. To all of you who are far off and abroad, if you're getting this transmission, just know you're not alone. Welcome to Israel the hidden bride of Yahushua, the Lamb's wife, waiting for her man. So be it, and good night.
costumes of ivory With your inside full of spite You're making love to demons In the synagogue Our peace was upon him. 